Um, so there's one uh, reason R is enclosed when Y equals X, Y equals X to the third prime volume, and R is revolving on Y equals Q. Okay, so I have Y equals X. And these are the Y equals X cube. Right. Okay. For what we're doing, we'll limit that to the first quadrant. So we're going to revolve this around which axis? Uh, y equals two. Y equals two. Okay. So I think we cross at one one, right? So the line of rotation is going to be somewhere like this. We're going to revolve around that. So let me ask this first of all, am I going to use this or what, or this or other shell? Right now, am I stuck to either one? Right now, I'm not stuck to either one. It totally depends on kind of your preference. So let me write down the function for y equals x and y equals x cube. So see, that's, that's, that's what we have this. What variable would you like to use to set this up? Do we want to look at the x rectangles that are thin vertical rectangles or the y rectangles that are horizontal? Uh, Sounds good. So rectangles that look like that. I think it's if you ever have doubt, I think it's really valuable to draw these rectangles to kind of get a sense of what's going to happen. If I take that rectangle, so it's supposed to be thin and vertically tall. If I wrap it around the axis, putting red, red shaded over, what's that going to look like? This washer, thin shell. It's going to be a washer. How come? Right, so this rectangle I drew does not reach the axis rotation, so there's going to be some kind of inner, inner radius. But it's going to be, it's like a potential to look at it from a cross section, it's going to look like this. It's going to be a circle with another circle plunked out of it. So basically, I'm finding volumes of things that look like that. Go with that so far. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what if instead I did this as a dy rectangle? <laughs> if I revolve that thing around y equals two, what am I going to be left with? Well, uh, shell. That's a simple shell. So basically. Subtle difference between this and this right here. So basically a thin cylindrical shell, like it's almost a circle, but it does have like this dy thickness to it. But basically that's how the that's how the circular area gets its volume by multiplying it by that that thickness. Um do we actually complete one of these? Which one makes more sense to do, dx or dy? Yeah, dx, how come? Yeah, so you can do a radical to change it. I think we could do it. I think it's not as simple as yeah, just leaving the variables there, like leaving the representation as they are right now. So take a dx rectangle. So now, next question is how do I find volumes of washers using the rate? Or better yet, what I'm basically making here is a cylinder with another cylinder kind of drilled in the middle of it. So, how do I find the volume of the cylinder? Let's go back and take a minute. How do I find the area of the circle? Pi r squared. And we're going to generalize that because we don't have one circle. We have one circle with another one punched out in the middle of it, right? So the area of that would be pi times outer radius squared minus pi times inner radius squared. But we're not really dealing with circles, we're dealing with cylinders. So how do I have to multiply by the height to get that dimension, right? So the area is equal to pi r squared times pi r squared, and that's what I'm using What is the height of these discs, these walkers? Yeah. It's 
into the F, right? So yeah, the, the thickness of the rectangle is where I get the that third dimension. Yeah, so I mean, because they're much more complicated. They're all essentially based on this one's based on the area of a circle. If we do the shell method, that's based on the area of rectangle. So knowing they're kind of based there, I would I would be comfortable with how they're derived. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I guess like that means memorizing it. Uh, go for it. I, I think it's more valuable to kind of know if you had to rebuild from scratch. Like that test anxiety hits everyone at a certain level. If you have something to memorize and you forget it, you're, you might be done. But if you kind of know how to build it up, you might have a better chance of. Of getting there on so this is how we're going to find the volume. So if we translate this to an integral, what do we get? Well, I'm going to add up all these, you know, between whatever my bounds are. Where am I getting my radii? Like, where does the outer radius going to come from in this example? What's that? So, but I have two different functions. We have to know which one. So that, that's the key here. It's not the one that's on top. It's the one that's furthest away from wherever you're making the notation. In this case, which function is that? In this case, that's x cubed. So pi times x cubed squared minus pi times the inner radius, which is Straight line. Oh, you're right. So I got to back track. So we're rotating over y equals two, right? So the radius is really the distance between y equals two and y equals x cubed. So pi times. 2 minus x cubed squared minus pi times 2 minus x squared. Question. So it's always a difference. It's always a subtraction. Um, what you might be thinking of is, if, thinking of is, let's say that y equals 2 with y equals negative 2. Then you'd be subtracting you know, x minus negative two. Mm -hmm. So that's that's when like the addition comes up, but that that is always going to be a difference. That's always going to be comparing to like y levels. If the two is at the end, so you got to get a you get a little bit fortunate with washing because you're squaring those. In this case, you're going to be kind of saved if you get that wrong. So that's not, if you do shells, you have to be careful. So let's be clear about this. Why am I doing, why are we doing two minus X cubed and not X cubed minus two? So on the interval we care about, so from zero to one, which is bigger, Y equals two or Y equals X cubed? So, this is a geometric thing where we're, we're trying to measure like the volume really is only meaningful if like all like the lengths that go into that volume are positive. So I want to subtract the biggest thing. So the bigger value minus the smaller value. So in this case, two is bigger than all of the y values inside that group. So that's Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, because so yeah, if the line was anywhere below the x-axis, not to scale at all. Actually, it's called negative one, so it is a scale. Y equals negative one. Still the same region. Uh, I still want to find the volume. I just want to rotate it over a different line. Um, let me ask this question first. What's the outer radius going to be? If I'm rotating over y equals negative one, 
line. The straight line this time. The straight line is further away from that axis. So, okay, so the outer radius is going to, is going to be dictated by the straight line. What's it actually going to be? Yeah, like if I'm trying to build up the radius in that case. X minus negative one over X plus one. So we're kind of talk about this from a lot of different angles. Anything else we want to talk about with this? But yeah, like this volume of revolution thing, there's a lot of different. I think it's a tough thing to, to really get down because there are so many like options we have. Among other things. What else? No. Okay. Y equals x squared. Negative three. Okay, so let's draw a picture. So basically I have y equals x squared and y equals the square root of x. Over negative three, right? And it tells you to use shells. Okay, so I'm rotating over a horizontal line. I think in this case we don't have a choice when we're using dx or dy rectangles. So since you are told to use shells, what kind of rectangles do we need to make? You have to use dy rectangles. So in this case, yeah, the fact they're asking for a certain method takes away that. That choice. So if I take a thin rectangle like that, rotate it with the line, I get a thin cylindrical shell. How do we find volumes using shells? We're going to go from A to B to what? Yeah, so let's let's so let's go back to the kind of the basics here. Um, everything we're doing with log revolution comes down to this shape. It comes down to a cylinder. Um, really, it comes down to part of the cylinder. So the one we just did was volumes by bits, right? In that case, you're kind of looking at the base, right? The the top of the cylinder, which is why you're treating it as the area of a circle. Which is why pi r squared shows up in the integral. Here, we're kind of looking at the outside of the cylinder. What shape does that part of the cylinder have? Well, how do I find its area? It's a rectangle, right? So the area of a rectangle is base times height. But the way we get the area, so the way we get like one face of that cylinder. Is it is the circumference of the circle? The circumference of the circle is the space. So in general, this two pi times radius times height. This is what our integrals look like. So two pi times r of y times h of y, and then to get our thickness, our volume, the dy represents the thickness. So that's your integral there. And one thing, the reason I really want to go back here is because one of these things involves pi, the other one involves a factor of two pi. I think if you don't know like where these things come from, where these samples come from, you might get lost and mix them up. Um, but to do shell method, that's the integral we gotta do. Two pi times the radius times the height. We're good so far. So now that we have those things we have to define. Um, so I made a rectangle here. We'll see. So if I wrap this around that axis, it's going to make a thin cylinder. What's the radius of that thin cylinder going to be? Well, let me ask, let me back up. 
Is the radius going to be something that involves y or something that involves x? Y. Y. It's going to it's a vertical separation because I'm I'm comparing two horizontal lines, right? So now I'm going to figure out in general how far apart are those things? Yeah. So what's the greater of the two y values? Top of what I got to get the top of the name. Uh, or maybe I'll skip it. I'm subtracting what from that? Negative three. So something minus negative three. So what is the something? Mm -hmm. It's simply y. So y is the independent variable here. That's the thing we control. We're going to integrate. So those a and b values on my bounds, my integral, those are y values. So basically, I get to dictate what the value of y is and kind of span through them as I build this integral. So that's the radius. Now we're going to find the height. Is the height something that involves x values or y values? So I'm going to ask you. Yeah, you're not wrong. Let me ask it the way I wanted to ask it. So the radius was basically you're trying to figure out the the distance between two horizontal lines, right? For the height, you're trying to find the distance between like two vertical lines, right? So I'm looking at a difference in x values. So let's start up there. This is the greater x value, right? For now, I'll call it x2 and x1. What is x2? Like, what is that function that defines the right side of my rectangle? So it's y equals x squared, or we want x equals square root of y. So I have square root of y. And then what dictates the left end of these rectangles? X equals y squared. So my height is radical y minus y squared. I think we're very close to them. Why What's that? Um, so it's all based on. So this rectangle we made, it's, maybe it's weird to use the word height because the thing is laying on the side, but I want to find this length right here, right? So I need to know where this is, where this is. And the difference between them. This happens on this y equals x squared, which we have to translate to in terms of y because of the integral we're doing. And the left end comes from this square root function, x equals y squared. So I suspect you're getting tripped up by the fact that we're defining things as y and you might not be able to do it. So yeah, both those functions there. One of them was, one of them was given to us as x equals y squared. The other one we had to convert. We had to isolate x two. I think we're almost done. We have all the pieces we need except for what? The bounds. What are the bounds? Would it be zero to one? I agree. Why is it zero to one? Right. So yeah, so it's, it's exactly. You can set these two equations equal to each other, and we're kind of fast forwarding past that. But picking up our set of equations equal to each other, you will get these two points: zero, zero, one. So both those points have the same x and y coordinates. So let me try to ask it this way. Am I looking at the x coordinates of those points or the y coordinates of those points? Why? So many, you're probably going to wind up with a case where those points are have different coordinates. So it, it's important to know which coordinate you actually care about. Why do I care about the y coordinates here? You're integrating on y. Yeah, it's, it really doesn't have as much to do with like what you're rotating over. It's about how the integral set up. Because if we set this up using disks, we'd be using um, X is other variable. So the bounds are from zero to one. Now I can just kind of drop in all the things we already talked about. Two times pi times the radius, which is y plus three, times the height, which is radical y minus y squared, dy. 
And then Rod, I just want the setup. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good point. A good question. Um, and I think as I answer the question, I'm going to encourage you to draw something. So then we'll go to kind of organize it. So the radius we talked about first, right? How do I find the radius of this cylinder? Right, so how far this rectangle I made is from this line I'm going to wrap it over. Negative, this negative three is very much out to do with radius, right? But the height, what does the height have to do with? How far this end is from this end, right? This line actually doesn't have anything to do with the height. That's why the negative three isn't quite like showing. But keep in mind, like when we're doing um, volumes by disc, we're dealing, so the volumes of the shell, you're doing radius and height, right? Volumes using discs and washers, or washers especially, all I'm dealing with is radius. So whatever calculation, like whatever like baseline you make the radius, better show up both ways. All right. Long discussion about volumes, we're going to totally warn you. There's a lot going on there. And I don't think it's spoiling anything to tell you you're going to see it. On Tuesday. Would you like to know? I don't care. What else? Go ahead. Um, did you like confirm with Monica that if we're given like those physics work problems, will it always be in like metric or will not always be in metric or imperial? What's what's the thing you're really worried about? I suspect I know what it is, but I want to find out. When you're doing metric, you have to make sure you multiply you know, gravity yeah. and gravity all the stuff before. Imperial. Oh, right. So the reason for that is because, like, if you're taking a physics lab right now, how do you calculate the weight of something? You go through its mass, right? The way we measure weight in imperial units, like already, you you know how much you weigh. You don't know what your mass is. Yeah. Because I'm, you even know what unit we use for mass in the three countries that use this system still. So that's the point. So that's why you don't use gravity because you're not dealing with mass ever. So for that, if you just take the weight times like a yeah, so like quintessential thing is like the density of water, right? Yeah. So in metric, that's a thousand kilograms per cubic meter. Mm -hmm. That's a mass density. I have no idea what the mass density is for water in imperial units. I know that it's sixty-two and a half uh, pounds per cubic foot. So if you're getting to if it's getting to in pounds per cubic foot, you've already bypassed like. The acceleration of gravity is already baked into what a pound is. So yeah, that's why you have to incorporate it again. How are we doing? Questions? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Excellent. All right, so how do we get started with things like this? How do we separate? So yeah, like, let's just put off the interval to the very end. Can we back our curve with this thing? Kind of fool's gold. It looks like you should be able to do this. So there's x squared minus 16. You got to do this. Um, so the thing we had is already completely factored. So I agree I have a over x plus 8. The thing I have over x squared plus 16 is not as simple as b. Yeah. Bx plus c. Do you remember why? Okay. It's because it's a squared. So here's kind of the assumption we make. When we're doing these, or not really an assumption, this is something we kind of, if it's not true, we make it true. Um, 
when we start partial fractions, we're going to start from a place where the degree of the numerator is strictly less than the degree of the denominator. Do we have that right now? Okay. We already have that. Let's say, for example, what we had up here was like x to the fifth. There's something else we'd have to do before we started going into the partial fraction decomposition. Do you remember what that is? You do a long division step to get to a place where your degree of the numerator is, is smaller. We already passed that. But because of that, what's the degree of this denominator x plus 8? 1, right? Which means the degree of the numerator has to be has to be not less than or equal to, it has to be less. So all, it has to be 0. That's why I just have a constant up there, no variables. What's the degree of x squared plus 16? 2, which means my degree is going to be 1. So what do first degree polynomials look like? They look like straight lines. That's why I had to be x plus 16. Does that make sense? I'm saying it does x squared. When you start the x plus 2 into the same degree, it's like not 16 in the um, if it was not there, I think it would still be kind of off. It would be bx plus c, or you let me let me show you on a side here. Let me. So what you're saying is this: one over x plus eight times x squared, right? Yeah. So we talked about this higher order factor thing, which is what we're dealing with right now. But we also talked about this case where you have a factor that's Actually, let me change this a little bit. What if it was x plus 16 squared? This is the case where we go, all right, the x plus 8 is still pretty simple. But in the other case, we kind of count up. So I want to represent all the different powers of x plus 16 if I don't do this. So these are Slightly different cases. Um, they end up kind of converging, um, but for the most part, we handle them differently. So, yeah, know the difference here. What am I squaring? Am I squaring x or am I squaring the entire factor? So, those get handled differently. So, are we okay with the, like this like skeleton? How we set this up? Where do we go with it from there? So I'm going, to, I'm going to finish the denominator by multiplying by x plus 8 and x squared plus 16. So I get 1 equals a times what? x squared plus 16. And what's the other term look like? The x plus 2 times x plus 8. So denominators are clear. Uh, we have a lot of options for how to figure out what a, b, and c are. Any ideas? <laughs> X eliminated is a good place to start. So what does that what does that do for us? That gives us one is equal to eighty. Eighty X. And then what happens to the rest of this? It goes to zero. So we get one of these constants for free, a equals one of these. So that's a good start. Um, something we've talked about, something I'm sure you've noticed is that solving for, solving for two variables is pretty simple. Solving for three variables is complicated than three. Okay, so how do we get, we got a, how do we get b and c? A lot of freedom, a lot of options. Yeah, that's what we can do. So I can expand everything. 1 equals ax squared plus 16a plus I'll put this like the cx squared plus 8cx plus cx plus 8c. So what can I do with this? Yeah. 
Give me one of those smaller equations I can make. A x squared plus b x squared equals what? Equals zero. So there are no x squared on the left hand side at equal sign, which means all the things that add up to x squared on the right hand side have to basically annihilate each other. Can I get what b is from that? I know that a plus b equals zero, right? And I already know what a is. So I think b equals its opposite. Are we good with that? How do I figure out what c is? What, what? You just like plug both of the a and b values back into the original. I could, but what else do I know? Yeah, I'm gonna, yeah, so that's one option we have. Um, I know all these constants have to have to add up, have to agree. So 16a plus 8c has to equal one. So what do I get? I get 16 over 80 plus 8c equals one. If someone gets the inverse inequality, got it out. So I get 8c equals 6480ths, which means that c equals a tenth. What about that 8 is 8, 8 over 80? Okay, so I got all my constants 1 over 80, negative 1 over 80, 1 over 80. How are we doing? Do you agree with me, first of all? Okay, cool. So that's like, I think that's like 70% of the job is to actually turn this function into something you can integrate because right now it's not really approaching. Does someone have it written down? Let me have these slides. Okay. So now we're integrating from negative one to one is what? 180 is over what? X plus eight. Okay, that's our new. Is this something we can do? How so? Okay, so one idiot. Natural log of the absolute value of x plus eight, right? What do we do with the other one? Yeah, that one, I don't know if substitution is going to get you there, but I, I'm pretty sure that if I break it up one step further, so as negative one eightieth x over x squared plus sixteen plus one tenth over x squared plus sixteen, that'll teach you this. Negative one over eighty x plus x per, over x squared plus sixteen. How's that one go? One of those is the other one is not. Because this second one here, I think I need u sub for this. So u equals x squared, but and I'm going to kind of accelerate because we're short on time. But u equals x squared plus sixteen. D u equals two x dx. So my u is in the denominator, right? I don't have du in the numerator, but I have some multiple of it that I can kind of work with. That one's going to be a natural log as well. So if I start manipulating this, I'll have u in the denominator. What will I have in the numerator? Negative one over forty. I'm not sure it is. Did I do that? Did I do that correctly? That's not yet. Okay. So we have du equals two x dx, right? I think you're right now. So if I divide both sides just by negative one fifty, what do I get? du over negative 150 equals 
negative one over eighty x dx. So that that was the wrong way to do it. Negative one over one sixty. What does that integral come out to be? Minus one six one minus one over one sixty times the natural log of the absolute value of x squared plus sixteen. That's what the last one looked like. Yeah. Uh, one and then. Oh, oh, I think call it. You could be called for arcane over here. Oh wait. That last one's gonna be in. Yeah, that last one's gonna be in arcane. I think it's, I think it's the arcane of x over four or something like it. Bottom to bottom line for y'all, this is way more involved than I could have you do on time. But the process is totally fair game. But like this thing fanned out in a lot of different directions there. Oh, just get the constants? That's wow. that's totally reasonable. Yeah, because that's basically we could have stopped there because what E B is saying is that it just wanted A, B, and C. We had that done a while ago. We had this in the real Noah. Um, will it if I'm thinking, will it be like some all of like problems or will it be like some more simpler problems? It's I I, I really may have to look into it. Um Kind of expect like what you've seen before, just fifty percent more of all of that. So instead of ten multiple choice questions, it's fourteen, a little bit less than half one. Instead of two, three responses, three. Are these very similar to the previous Similar in form, actually. I won't be on campus, but I'm going to host this. I, I think I'll put an announcement. I'll put a reminder on campus, but I'll be on Zoom from eight to ten. Yeah. Well, I, I thought that'd be convenient for y'all. Is that okay? Okay, I'll, that's I, I, that day's wide open for me. So, Sebastian, absolutely, absolutely. One last thing I'll tell you before you go is, um, I think I've spoiled y'all about having your test graded like day of. Um, I don't count that. Just so I have a. A huge milestone um, the day after your final for my PhD program. So I'm probably going to spend, I'm probably going to freak out about that the day of and either drown my sorrows or celebrate for the rest of that day. So when? Hopefully next year. So if this goes well, that means like basically they approve my, what I want to do for my dissertation, then I got to do it.